my far right is Susan Shirk, who's familiar to all of you here at UCSD. She's a longtime friend of mine from the China, China Beat, and she is uh, she's the director of the, of the Institute on Global Conflict and Cooperation and has so many um, publications on China that I would use up all of our time if I started listing them. I'll simply say that she's provided me fodder in many a speech about China over the past couple of years because Susan's, uh, one of her recent books about China was called Fragile Superpower. And the wonderful anecdote she tells is that when she's in the U.S., people say, what do you mean fragile? And when she's in China, they say, what do you mean superpower? And this does, <laughs> this does encapsulate a lot of what is going on. Um, we have Larry Smarr in the middle from the California Institute for Telecommunications and Information Technology, the founding director of that institute, and uh, has, again, so many professorships that I will let you read them in, in the, uh, the, the, uh, the dossier. I'll say an outstanding expert on the convergence of data and real life, data and medical science, what we do with the ever-increasing power of to manipulate and acquire data to be able to change uh, ongoing and, and long-standing problems in life. Now we have Peggy Johnson from Qualcomm, who is Executive Vice President and President of Global Market Development at Qualcomm. And she has uh, an expert on wireless technology, which has new relevance to us just at this moment on, on stage. But Qualcomm, of course, part of the combined wireless tech and life sciences tech uh, powerhouse that has been so important in San Diego in, in, in recent years. So I would like to um, start with you uh, Peggy Johnson, we were hearing from Evan Williams just now about the way that social media have had an effect domestically, culturally, individually, and politically. Um, what do you think is the next stage of understanding the effect of wireless technology and, and in what other ways that we're not yet anticipating? Can we make sense of Evan Williams' closing comment that we're just scratching the surface? What do you see and know about that the rest of us should be aware of in the potential here? Um, well, a couple things. Um, so first of all, I've, I've had the pleasure of seeing for the last 22 years at Qualcomm the accelerating pace of innovation in, in this field from voice to data to computers in our hands. So it's been amazing. And we at Qualcomm feel the same way. We're just scratching the surface. A couple of things coming up next sort of uh, that we'll hear about in the next one to three years are peer-to-peer um, -peer communications. So when you think about the Arab Spring and when some of the governments were shutting down the, the infrastructure, how great would it be for your radio in your pocket, and there's many radios in your cell phone, to talk to someone close by? And that's very possible. That's something that I think, um, you know, in a Twitter fashion, you could, you could relay messages and then out to a point outside the, the country. Um, so that's, that's one thing that's coming. Another thing is this idea of context that uh, Ev talked a little bit about it, just knowing um, you, we have this deluge of data coming at us all the time. What do you do with all of it? How do you filter it appropriately for you, which is different from me and for each of us here? And part of that is uh, your phone will and is starting to have many, many sensors on it. It has a few things now, an accelerometer, a few, you know, few uh, lightweight sensors, but there's a lot more coming, and we can know where you're at, um, what's important to you, we can listen to your surroundings, and we can feed you appropriate data at the appropriate time um, so you don't, you're not overwhelmed. So those are a couple things that are, that are coming that I think in the hands of our developers out there could turn into some fascinating innovations. And I'm just gonna ask you one follow-up question here. I was seeing, for reasons I'll get into later, a wonderful old movie a couple days ago called Mona Lisa. It's a noir set in London with Bob Hoskins, and it's great, but one of the riveting scenes in it was when they give Bob Hoskins a cell phone. He says, how does this work? How does it know where to send me the signals? You know, how does it know what the number is? So that was 20 years ago. People had not seen, he, that could be a plot element in a movie. 20 years from now, what do you think would be a, if people look back to the movies right now, what would they find unbelievably primitive about our cell phone, our wireless technology? Well, the fact that it's not um, monitoring what's going on on our bodies right now. It's, so, it's a computer in your hands. It could, it could make such a better hearing aid, for instance. It could be signal processing in a much better way, more um, real time rather than you know, having to turn things up and down. It could be constantly measuring your blood pressure. It, it um, could be, it, you know, today when you put a blood pressure monitor on, you, um, or you might take your blood pressure once a day, 
obviously, if you had a consistent view of that, it would, it would present a different picture to your doctor. So I think we'll look back and say, you know, our kids will say, what, you, know, you didn't know what your blood pressure was all the time? And, and uh, you know. <laughs> so in addition to being very interesting, what you said is a perfect segue to the work that Larry Smarr is doing. So, so would you give us the same perspective of what you're in the middle of that you think the rest of us don't know enough about and should be excited about? Well, uh, fortunately, you'll be able to come tonight to the Cal IT2 from 6 to 9 and see a lot of the virtual reality and extreme visualization, so I don't have to talk about that. Uh, but for the last 10 years since we were founded, uh, we have been looking at the digital transformation of the environment, energy, health, and culture. And uh, health in particular is probably the nearest term uh, change, uh, just as was mentioned. You know, the, the thing we know the least about is the insides of our body. How can you not know the state of your body? That's just nuts. And yet, we don't. And your car, you've got, you know, during the 50s, you had to go wait till smoke came out of the hood. That would be like having a symptom. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, in medicine today, right? Uh, wait till you're broken and then go to the doctor. And Anyway, the point is instead what we have is little flash memories at the spark plugs, the brakes, everything else that you know record every second. You go in the garage, it reads that out, it compares it with all the other cars like yours in the country over the net. And if you're in the middle of the bell curve for that value, then of course you're fine. If you're out here, something's off on one of the time series of the data, you pull a module out, put a new module in, and 200,000 miles later, your car runs just the way it did the day you bought it. Why aren't we doing that with our bodies? And so one of the things we've we explored is as the, in this 10 years, we've seen computers are now 1,000 times faster and 1,000 times cheaper, but genome sequencing is a million times cheaper than it was when the first human genome was done in 2000. That means that all doctors today operate without using your genetic information. And I was just talking to the new class of, of uh, medical students at UCSD last week, and I said, by the time you're in practice, you'll assume that you have the full genome of your patient and relative to all of the other uh, people in our population uh, as a basis for medicine. So we're in the, middle, in the middle of a radical shift. And so one of the things I've been doing in my own body is anticipating that. I, I take my blood every quarter. I measure, measure 60 different chemicals. I keep track of the state of my colon, where actually you have 10 times as many cells in your microbe as you do in your entire human body, and 100 times the genes in those microbes that you have in your human DNA, and that's completely ignored by doctors. In fact, they go in and napalm the, uh, with broad spectrum antibiotics uh, without any thinking about what that does to your immune system or anything else, because those genes and those microbes are co-expressing with your human genes to create you, and we ignore that. So there's this, this complete step function, I think, that we're in the middle of, and the ability to have the cell phone be your body area sensor and read this stuff out and into data banks that will be uh, possible to look across the population, hopefully of the privacy-conserving um, algorithms, uh, to really begin to understand uh, ourselves and, 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 and instead of having a sickness, fixing sickness paradigm, it will be instead a wellness paradigm that uh, each of us uh, takes more personal responsibility for keeping our own bodies in good shape. Let me ask one follow-up <clears throat> that I know could elicit a 10-hour answer, but, but for a sort of one-minute answer yeah. to it. Fundamentally, will these innovations mean that we could spend 100% of the G GDP on health care, or will it be some way that we could put a ceiling on the GDP for health care? Well, currently, what is going to bankrupt our country before anything else, the biggest threat to our country is that three quarters, we've grown to the point that three quarters of our people are overweight or obese, pre-diabetic, and there's not enough money in the universe to take care of that. Until people take care of their own bodies, and avoid becoming chronically ill voluntarily, which is what we're doing now in a mass way in our culture, then uh, yes, we are going to completely bankrupt the country. What is the counter-revolution, which you see here in La Jolla, 
is uh, look around and then go to the Midwest and look around and notice the difference. There is a counter-revolution of personal responsibility, personal health maintenance, thinking about what you eat, thinking about exercise, and it's spreading across the country. The question is, will it spread fast enough? So, Susan, one of your areas of longstanding expertise has been the interaction of media and politics, media and society. You're one of your, I think probably your latest book was this one on changing media in, in China. As you hear about these revolutions in monitoring and information transfer and health and communications, how do you think we should understand them politically, you know, their, their effect on societies and the social media and what it means in China, what it means in the U.S.? You as a political scientist, what do you think as you hear this sort of discussion these, or anything else you'd like to tell us? Well, as I think about uh, these innovations, I think that uh, in these fields, we're not going to see any cutting edge major innovations occurring in China because the, China has great ambitions to be uh, a technology superpower. But the way they're going about it is to throw a whole lot of money into it and to uh, have the central government set priorities and to give most of the money to research institutes and big state-owned enterprises. So uh, no garage-based innovation no uh, small-scale innovation of the type that we know uh, really matters. So uh, in some ways, however, of course, what China's accomplishing is very substantial. Uh, we have a project in which we're trying to look at these different areas of Chinese innovation more systematically. And uh, I have to tell you that one of the areas we thought was very successful was high-speed rail. You Seriously. All have you, yes. Well, you know, there was this terrible accident. So I think what that shows you is that that ambition, that mad rush to get things done quickly, the eagerness to, uh, because of nationalism and this kind of national ambition, to show that everything is Chinese origin technology, but in fact it's not actually true. What's happening is that they are uh, adopting in one way or another foreign technologies. And then there is process innovation, which reduces the costs and makes things happen very quickly. And some of that is great for the world. Um, you know, the solar and wind um, uh, bubble in China, and it really is a kind of bubble, but what it's done is uh, create uh, the and engineered solar panels and wind uh, farms that other countries can adopt mu for a much lower price. And as uh, citizens of the planet, we all care about that because that will help, um, you know, reduce climate change. So it's a complicated picture. Yeah. And, and, and no doubt, because I have followed your works over the years, what you say sounds exactly right to me. But I, I want to ask one implication of it. You live here in San Diego, which is the focus of all this communications and life science innovation. You often travel to China, where lots of these things are sort of creamed off, and, and, and as, as you've just described. Do you have any cautions to give to your colleagues here in the life sciences and the, uh, the wireless field about how they should, uh, do they need to guard themselves against the next round of this being done from the Chinese, or just not worry about it? Well, I mean, I was listening to the discussion about Twitter. Now, with Facebook and Twitter being, f and Google to a large extent, being frozen out of China, many of us said, okay, this is going to be bad for China because what we're gonna get is monopolistic companies in all of these sectors. They will have a Chinese um, version. <laughs> Chinese version will be less good and it will be done by some monopolistic com company that's favored by the government. I don't think actually that's happened. I think that the Chinese recognize that some competition is good, and in the microblock space, for example, there uh, actually are two main uh, microblocks, uh, Tencent, TT, and Weibo. Weibo seems to be leading, but from what I see and what I understand is that Weibo has some features that are better than Twitter. And Weibo is going international. Weibo is going to Taiwan, they're going to Hong Kong, 
And there's no reason they couldn't go to non-Chinese so markets. You're not suggesting that those are crossing national boundaries, are you? Abs so, <laughs> this is an inside China joke, sorry. <laughs> I would, I, of course, I would not say that, but. Um, there is one China. Right, but um, you know, watch out for Weibo. Yeah. Oh, very interesting. So a, a recurring theme in our discussions here, recurring because I keep asking it, is about <laughs> the, 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 the pessimistic potential of some of, these, um, some of these technological developments. And part of what you've descri been describing and all its, its potential is a sort of panoptican nightmare, too, where everything about you is monitored all the time. You know how many days until you're going to die. Everybody knows where, uh, the government knows where you are at all times. How do you think about the the nightmare possibilities of omnipresent, every second communication and monitoring, and, and, and what, what do you think about that? Well, obviously that's, a, that's an issue, and we think about that a lot. Um, but that's where I think having the computer in your hand on yourself and you controlling and allowing what crosses over into the cloud mm -hmm. or elsewhere um, is, is an empowering thing that we need to think about and not push everything out that way. You, you hear a lot about um, the com computing in the cloud where our, our handsets are pretty, pretty hefty right now, going you know, dual core, quad core, they're, um, they're capable of a lot. And so if you could filter the information that comes into you and then process it custom to you and only allow what you want to go back the other way. I, so I think there are ways to help control that. Right. And Larry, you mentioned appropriate privacy algorithms. Could you expand on that? Yeah, I mean, I think fundamentally we, we need a legal uh, reform in this country that you own your data. And just like the government can't come into your house with a search warrant, uh, they shouldn't be able to get your data, corporations shouldn't be able to get your data without your explicit permission or a process like court warrants. Uh, other countries, I think, have perhaps more sophisticated um, thinking about data, but it, it, since I will agree with Evan, you haven't seen anything yet. You're, you're gonna see hundreds, thousands of times as much data about yourself being generated as you have now. And so if we don't get on this soon, uh, it'll be too late. And then a lot of bad things could very well happen. But the fundamental reason that like I put all of my data out uh, on my portal or uh, on, on my PowerPoints uh, is because, you know, I'm, I can get a lot of people who have things like I have talking to me and sharing experiences, which is probably more knowledge to me about the things I care about than I'll ever get from 15 minutes twice a year with a doctor. And Susan, you're an expert on the society which has sort of taken the constant monitoring to its extreme. What can we learn about whether they'll be able to sustain that, whether that's a danger for us? Well, um, it's a race between the Chinese citizen and the Chinese state. And, the, uh, uh, and it, it does stimulate a lot of innovation on both sides. Uh, I think that the, right now the microblog space is where you see uh, the Chinese government trying to play catch up because they haven't so far developed a way to really completely control the microblog. And the other thing about microblogs, Twitters, is that it allows individuals to become these public personalities with large numbers of followers. So just about, I mean, including people like reform economists with hundreds of thousands, if not millions of followers. And that has, uh, is really potentially quite threatening. Uh, politically to the Chinese government. So um, I have confidence that, there, that the Chinese state will never be able to con completely control this. But it, I think most of us have been sobered by the fact that if you look at search, for example, uh, still 95% uh, or more of the searches in China are done to Chinese sites. Mm -hmm. You know, the Great Firewall around China still persists. And a lot of this evasion software to climb the wall does not seem to be easily adopted. So that's not working as well as we thought. Um, and then the fact that the Chinese government, including the private firms like Sina, you know, are so 
dependent on the party, the propaganda authorities. They're practically part of the Chinese state. So uh, really, the most powerful methods are not the technological ones. They're the political and sociological ones and economic ones. Um, and that is very, very difficult to break. You know, um, I saw a posting recently of a foreigner in China who said, you know, uh, posted, hey guys, I want to get on Facebook, but I can't seem to be doing uh, to gain access, duh. Um, uh, and what should I do? And the responses were very interesting from other netizens. They were things like, well, help us get democracy first, and then we'll help you get on Facebook. So I think there's, I think the, uh, the netizens, there is a growing sophistication about the censorship and a growing frustration among people who otherwise would not be politically active, that they are very frustrated that they are being treated like children. And I think eventually it could become a focal point for an opposition movement. Oh, interesting. I have Twitter scale questions for each of our two tech people here. I was asking uh, Evan Williams, you know, the main thing that he knows from his world that he wishes Ever, other people to know. What's the main thing you know in Twitter scale from being in the middle of this wireless technology you wish the rest of us knew? Um, just the impact that wireless is having on the emerging markets because you're we're giving people who had no access to education and health and all sorts of information for the first time access to that and they could be the next Steve Jobs. Who knows where the next innovation is going to come from but in our lifetime you know literally billions of people will be connected to the internet for the first time. And that, I think, is going to have a profound impact on the world. And Larry, the main thing you wish we all knew? Well, I think that the fact that your body has all of these data available for measuring and that the, and that the speed with which the uh, cost is going down means that we will be able to do this in a, in, a, in a very routine way for a large number of people. And, the, and I think the reason at CalIT2 we have a lot of projects, you know, sort of living in the future of this is because we've got to get a whole new medical community trained. Um, and and, and I, think, I think that's the real problem that so many of the current medical community really don't see this coming and don't have a way to get it into clinical practice in a fast way, the way we assume things happen in internet speed. To keep the program moving, what we should do right now is I hope you'll join me in thanking our panelists, Susan Scherf, Larry Smarr, and Peggy Johnson.